Okay. And I do. Hello. Have, sorry. Go I, ahead, Lori. Uh, I was going to say, I do have the housekeeping slide. Welcome, everyone. Today, we are the New Mexico Telehealth Alliance, and we are excited to bring a webinar for you just to let you know that these will be recorded and made available on our website. If you do not wish to be recorded, go ahead and turn your camera off, um, put your name and organization in the chat so we can have a lively discussion. We will keep you all muted. You're welcome to ask questions, um, but just for the sake of interruptions, we'll keep you muted um, and you can unmute with questions. And then let us know in the chat or by raising your hand if you have anything and we will work with you to address it. I am Stetson Berg. I'm the chair of the New Mexico Telehealth Alliance. And today we're gonna to be learning how to perform a physical via telemedicine. And I have the pleasure of working with Dr. Tarun Girotra. He is an assistant professor of neurology at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. He received his MD in India in 2011 and went on to Henry Ford Health System in Detroit to finish his neurology res residency in 2017. He's also currently the medical director of the ACCESS program. If you're not familiar with the ACCESS program, it is a neurology, neurosurgery, and now cardiology consult program that comes out of the University of New Mexico to originating sites all around the state. He also sub subsequently completed a fellowship in vascular neurology from the Medical University of South Carolina in 2018 and has gone on to be published in several articles, um, peer reviewed journal journals and book chapters. His clinical interests include acute stroke care, secondary stroke prevention, telestroke and medical education, which all leads him here to speak with us today. And I can say I've personally worked with him for many years and he is a wonderful human being on top of being intelligent and passionate about mm -hmm. telemedicine. And Dr. Jarocher, please feel free to chime in with anything I may have missed or that you would like to introduce. No, thank you, Stetson. You were too kind. Um, more praises than I'm used to. But again, thank you to New Mexico Telehealth Alliance for allowing me the opportunity to talk about a very interesting topic because um, as a stroke neurologist, you know, telemedicine and stroke kind of go a long way back <clears throat> around mid 2000s is when stroke started adopting telemedicine as a routine practice. And um, with the COVID pandemic, all specialties and all kinds of pro, uh, healthcare uh, systems have started adopting telemedicine in one way or the other. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. So, um, and then, like Stetson said, um, I'm also the medical director of the ACCESS program at UNM, and that has allowed me to really, you know, develop my skills and learn a lot of tele, learn a lot about telemedicine from folks like Stetson, um, who are kind of leading the path of telemedicine in the state of New Mexico. Um, so for today's webinar, I was thinking about what can I do to help all the audiences who are taking care of our, <clears throat> excuse me, patients in the telemedicine setting. And I thought about how we can maximize uh, the information that we can obtain from evaluating patients through telemedicine, because historically, telemedicine has always been considered as a least favorable or a low yield when it comes to an examination. Um, but over the last two years, especially, there has been a lot of publications and personal experiences combined with how we conduct and optimize a a physical exam on telemedicine. So with that, I'm gonna briefly just talk about the various levels of examination that the CMS has, um, has uh, in place. So CMS basically divides the examination into two levels, a general multi-system exam or a single organ system exam. And these are the different levels of examination levels, starting from problem focus, which is the most brief to all the way to comprehensive. And as you can see, there is a lot of overlap between the general multi-system and single organ system examination. And when you combine these different levels of physical examination documentation to the HPI uh, documentation, along with the medical decision-making, you would then be able to build the uh, encounter at various levels. So the purpose of this talk would be merely to focus on different levels of the examination. 
And Dr. Drotra, are you saying that all of these are possible over telemedicine or do you need yes. to be in person to get, you know, just comprehensive, for example? So, and that's an excellent question, Stetson, because uh, these are the different organ systems identified that we would have to cover different elements and to be able to qualify as comprehensive in either general multi-system or single organ system. And the purpose of this uh, webinar for me was to actually show to the audience how we can maximize the examination on a telehealth setting, not just to understand what's happening with our patient and to help them, but also to be also for us to allow to maximize our billing potential. Uh, but again, this is one component of the billing when we talk about the HPI and medical decision making. So um, with that being said, I'm going to cover a few basic etiquettes of telehealth examination. And these are something that I've learned over the last two years of doing a lot of telestroke and tele neuro visits as an outpatient. Um, from a provider standpoint, when you do have a telehealth examination, it is very important and crucial for you to be in a private room and for you to behave like you're, you're actually doing an in-person visit, i.e. dress yourself professionally. Um, you know, it's, it's always a, um, it's, an, it's not an intuitive thing to actually interact with human beings on Zoom or other sort of audio video platforms. So we have to remind ourselves to position ourselves about a couple of feet away from the camera so that we are in the center of the uh, screen for the patient. And we have to be sure that we have good lighting in our workspace. A good idea, I mean, we have lots of USB uh, supported lights that we can attach to our workstation, which is uh, providing adequate lighting for the provider. And then that allows you to form a good connection with your patient. It's always a good idea to check your audio and video before starting visits. And in, in the world of camera, we are in the world of audio video meetings, we are tend to focusing on the screen, but it's always a good idea to actually look at the camera itself. So the patient on the other hand can connect with you and feel like you're actually talking to them and making an eye contact or at least simulating an eye contact. Um, and to that point, I've seen where providers will, you know, shrink the image of the patient and move it right under right. the camera. So when you're looking at the patient, it looks like you're looking at the camera. So that's one helpful thing we've done at UNM. Right. And that's an excellent advice as well, which sometimes I have done as well. So thank you for that, Stetson. Um, before um, encounter or starting a patient encounter on telehealth, it's very important to confirm that you are talking to the right patient by asking for two patient identifiers and asking for their consent to be to be continuing their care on a virtual appointment. And you know, in the modern uh, sort of era, two years of post pandemic, where we all have gotten used to uh, a virtual setting. Uh, it's important for us to remind the patients about potential distractions. For example, if you're going to be using double screen at your workstation and you will be reviewing images or lab information of the patient on one screen and the camera is attached to the other screen, the patient may perceive that you're not paying attention because you're constantly looking in the other direction. So it's important to set up expectation if you are working in a situation where you may appear distracted, but in fact, you're actually providing them the care that they really deserve by informing the patients about how you will be looking at certain different directions at certain time, but your focus is completely dedicated towards them. And over the last couple of years, again, these are my um, personal experience driven um, suggestions for providers to also let their patients uh, know about certain expectations and help suggestions to help maximize their encounter with the telehealth provider. So again, ask them to be in a private room with minimal distraction. Ask them to wear loose fitting or comfortable clothes just in case you have to visualize certain part of their body to do an exam. Um, typically, it's a good idea to have them bare feet if possible and ask them to check their audio video before the starting of the visit. And again, having an adequate lighting, especially on the patient side is going to be important when we have to rely so much on observation skills of, of the examination. Um, if, if you are doing a lot of telehealth visits, it's a good idea to build in your protocol that you request or somebody from your team requests the patients to actually check their blood pressure and pulse with a simple home blood pressure cuff machine and a temperature prior to your visit, because 
a lot of patients, as we know, would only check their blood pressure when they're visiting the doctor's office. So um, this would be a good time for them to actually check their blood pressure, which will allow the provider to actually give meaningful discussion to the patient. And again, an out of the box thing um, that we have started um, considering is if a patient has any rash or swelling area that they are concerned about that they want to have a visit for, it's always a good idea to actually for them to take a picture of it and send them to you via secure portal before the clinic visit or during the clinic visit. Because in, in this modern era, our cell phones are pretty good with their camera capabilities and that may actually be better than a web camera's um, um, uh, clarity. So with this, now we're gonna focus on demonstrating the examination maneuvers and Mr. Berg was kind enough to volunteer as the patient for this encounter. Um, and I'll be going over these different form of examination starting from constitutional and then marching down from eyes, ear, nose, throat, cardiac and pulmonary, abdominal, and then kind of finishing off with the more difficult perceived examinations of neuro, psych and musculoskeletal. To, in order for us to really gain the most out of this webinar, what I would request everyone to do is to, once I stop sharing the screen, you should be able to see three dots on the upper right hand corner of uh, Stetson's screen or picture. If you click that, you should be able to select an option of pin and that will allow Stetson screen to be in the center of your screen, which will allow you to actually visualize and simulate how a real patient encounter would look like to you. So with that, I'm gonna stop share. I'm gonna ask everyone, I'm gonna wait uh, just a minute for allowing everyone to actually pin Stetson's video in their, um, on their Zoom. So with that being said, I'm gonna start um, uh, sort of an encounter with Mr. Bergen. So Mr. Berg, my name is Dr. Givatra. I'm one of the stroke neurologist at UNM and you know, we'll be conducting a physical exam and we're gonna be covering different aspects of a physical exam through a telemedicine encounter. So typically I would start with a constitutional exam in which I'm gonna visually observe Mr. Berg, uh, Mr. Berg's expression, his level of comfort and his environment. So he appears not to be in distress. He's you know, well-dressed, well-groomed, and he doesn't appear to be, at least from what we can see, in a very, he's appearing to be in a very good, healthy living environment without a lot of uh, mess or uh, problems there. Uh, typically, again, if not already done, I would ask our patient whether they have a blood pressure cuff, a simple blood pressure cuff from their, that they could have get, gotten from the pharmacy and check their blood pressure uh, along with, and that would give us their temperature uh, and their pulse rate as well. Um, if they have a thermometer which they can use for measuring an oral temperature, that would be actually ideal as well. So with this, in the constitutional examination system, we have been able to check the general appearance of our patient, their blood pressure, pulse rate, and temperature. So those, those are the four points that we can easily get on a telemedicine exam. Moving on to the next system, which is going to be the eyes. Um, so for the next part, Mr. Berg, I'm gonna ask you to look straight into the camera. And now just with your eyes, look to the right, all the way to the right. Now all the way to the left. Now look about up towards the ceiling and down towards the floor. Now I want you to look towards the down and right side, down and left side. Now up and left side, up and right side. Perfect. So with this, we were able to actually see his extraocular movements were normal. And as you're coming close to the uh, camera, I want you to put your index fingers underneath your eyes and gently pull the skin down and look up towards the ceiling, by which way we are able to see that his sclera looks nice and white and his conjunctiva is showing a good uh, hue of red color, which indicates that your hemoglobin is likely doing good. Now, the next part I'm gonna do is if I can ask you to take a little flashlight uh, and come as close to the camera as possible. Now, I want you to take the flashlight and gently move it towards your right eye, good. So his pupils are reactive and now take it away. Now do the same on the other side. So his pupils are reactive both with direct and consensual um, light reflex. And then 
it's easy, it's much easier to say when somebody's eyes are of light color like Mr. Berg's compared to somebody who has brown colored eyes or dark colored eyes. So in those situations, we may have to ask the patient to turn the lights down in their room so that we can focus on their pupils much more easily. Now, as you have done the pupillary exam, if there is a family member so next to the patient, we can also use their help to do a visual field exam. Um, since we don't have anybody, I'm just going to share how I instruct a family member to check a visual field exam. So I usually ask the family member to sit right in front of the patient and the patient to face the family member so that they're about a couple of or three feet away from them. And then I ask the patient to focus just on their nose, on their family member's nose. And then I ask the family member, while your uh, family member is looking at your nose, I want you to wiggle either your right hand or left hand and ask the patient to just point to the side that they're wiggling their hand, which gives me a crude idea whether they have any visual field deficit or visual field cut or not. But for this purpose, because we have only Mr. Burke, this would be out of the scope of a single patient examination. Again, some of the newer technology that is coming into the field of telehealth is there are smartphone camera apps that are being developed, which if you attach a special lens to the camera and the patient is then able to take a picture of their uh, retina and fundus. So those are yet considered to be a research level investigations, but as we go forward, these may become kind of a mainstay of telehealth examination tools and equipment that we can use for a detailed eye exam, especially for those patients who have diabetic retinopathies. Um, as we move forward, we're gonna go down to the ENT examination. So Stetson, if you can come forward again and use the flashlight, um, open your, I want you to open your mouth and stick your tongue out and kind of tilt your head back a little bit so we can see his palate and uvula and the back of his throat or the pharynx very well here. So it's allowing me to see that I don't see any inflamed um, adenoids, any redness, inflammation in the back of the throat, which, you know, it's very good. And then the overall hydration of his mucus in the mouth also looks good. Uh, now, similarly, if you don't mind tilting your head back a little bit, and then uh, with your one finger, just pull your nose a little bit back and then point to the point with the flashlight inside your nose. And we can see relatively within the restraints that you know, there's obviously no polyps or no mass and there's no um, discharge that we can see, which is suggested that you know, he is not having any overt sinus or you know, nose infection. Moving on to the next part, I'm gonna ask you Stetson, if you can take your index finger and press on your cheek where I'm pressing right now. Does this cause any pain? No. How about over your eyebrows right here? Nope. So we checked his uh, sinuses for any tenderness and he's not having any. Now we're gonna check your lymph nodes in the neck. So when you bend your neck back a little bit, there are two bulky muscles which kind of run on the sides of your neck on either side. So these are the sternocleidomastoid muscle. I want you to run your fingers at the front edge and let me know if you feel any bumps or lumps there. No. And how about at the back edge of that muscle? No. I want you to do the same thing over your jawline. Nope. And then under your chin? Mm -mm. Okay. Nope. So we were able to evaluate for most of the next cervical uh, lymph node channels and none of them are inflamed. And then I'm gonna ask you, I know you have your headphones on for this visit, but what I would ask our patients for their hearing equity is to gently rub their fingers about an inch away from both ears and ask them if it feels the same or if it sounds the same on both sides. That's a, that gives us a rough or a crude estimate about their hearing equity. Um, and then the last thing I always check is the mastoids. So a mastoid is that bony prominence right behind your ear. I want you to press right there hard. And does this cause any pain? Nope. Okay. And same thing on the other side. Good on both sides. So, and then if there are any auditory or hearing complaints or pain in the ear, I would usually ask the, the patient to keep their camera as close to their ear as possible for me to see any redness or discharge. Um, 
in the setting of a home visit, this is kind of as much as what we can do for an ENT exam. But if your patient is in a setting of an emergency room and you're doing telemedicine uh, in a hospital setting or an ER-based setting, there are digital autoscopes that a nurse or a technician at bedside can also hold inside the ear of the patient and actually allow you as a provider remotely evaluating the patient to look inside the external auditory canal and the tympanic membrane. And similarly, use those scopes to look inside your nose. Um, but for the purpose of home visits, those equipments will not be typically available. Now, moving down to the next organ system or kind of combining cardiac and pulmonary organ system, observation is very important because in that way, I can look at our patient's general distress level. So Mr. Berg is looking very comfortable. His nose is not flaring and I don't see any accessory muscle use of his respiratory. And these are just my observation, which will allow you to indicate or show or understand whether a patient is having any respiratory distress or not. We would have calculated the pulse rate in the vital signs evaluation as the constitutional system, uh, which would be considered part of the cardiovascular examination too. For the, the respiratory rate, it's, it's, it's hard to see the chest movements, but one way which we, which whereby we can do or look at the chest movement easily is by asking the patient to cross their arms like this and just breathe normally. So with the movement of the elbows, we are able to actually see his respiratory breathing movements. And we can count how many times he breathes in 15 seconds or 30 seconds and extrapolate that to what is his respiratory rate in uh, every minute. Um, the other thing also that I would ask patients to do if I am worried about their respiratory status, I'm gonna, uh, we can bring the arm down and I'm gonna ask the patient to take a big deep breath and breathe out. Okay. And this was good that he had a good inspiration and good expiration. And sometimes when I am worried about a patient with asthma or COPD, I would ask their, I would ask if they're on a phone or an iPad to bring the speakers or the microphone as close to their chest as possible so I can hear for any wheezing. Um, but in, in Mr. Burke's case, we're not hearing any obvious wheezing and he's not complaining of any chest or respiratory discomfort. The next thing I uh, usually look for is the skin tone and looking for any sinuses. So a good area is around the mouth. So Stetson, if you can come as close to the camera and show me your lips area. So we can see that his um, mucosa is not having any bluish hue, which would be an indication of low oxygen in his system. So that's looking good. And you can also open your mouth and stick your tongue out for us to pick up any signs of sinuses there. And that's all clean. Uh, the next thing I uh, check is a capillary refill. So I ask our patient to bring their nail in front of their camera as much as possible. And Stetson, I, with the other hand, I want you to press on the nail bed and then immediately release it. And I'm gonna see how the blanched nail bed turns into red. And with Stetson's nails, he's regaining his normal tone of the redness, uh, red color very quickly, which is indicating that he has a good uh, capillary refill time. Um, the next thing um, that I would ask our patients to check for when I'm focusing on the cardiac um, exam is the edema. So for the next part, Stetson, I'm gonna ask you to tilt your camera down so we can take a look at your legs below the knee. I wore my shorts as you instructed, doctor. Thank you. So we're gonna ask our patient to take their thumb and kind of dig it into the shin, the inner part of the shin where the bony prominence is. So Stetson, if you don't mind doing that. I don't know if this will be close enough. Yep, good. So this allows us to look at any dependent or edema in the lower extremities which as you may be aware, would be an important thing to look for are in our patients with CHF and other cardiac abnormalities while we are managing their or titrating their diuretics. Um, and again, this was the cardiac and the pulmonary exam. And again, you know, as, as if you are working in a setting of ER-based or hospital-based telemedicine program, there are digital stethoscopes that your team member on the side of the patient can hook up into the telemedicine cart and place on the patient's chest, which will allow you to auscultate them remotely without actually being there in the same room. 
Um, and these are quite common and readily available uh, equipments for those settings uh, like the ER or hospital-based settings. And if you do have a patient who has predominantly asthma or COPD, and especially with the pandemic, they opted not to expose themselves or come out to the clinic or the doctor's visit, you can ask them to buy a simple peak flow meter at home, whereby they can measure their expiratory um, force at home and track how they're going uh, over a longitudinal period of time and allow you as their physician or provider to actually get good uh, quality information about their respiratory status. The moving on to the next uh, system, which would be the abdominal system. Now abdominal system requires a lot of understanding of the abdomen and how to do the exam on the patient's side. So typically what I do first is I or show the patient and help them understand their anatomy of their abdomen. So Stetson, if you don't mind pointing the camera towards your belly, I'm gonna show them. So I want you to feel for the lower edge of your rib cage. Okay, so the upper boundary of your abdomen starts here. Now I want you to draw or sort of think of an imaginary line running straight from your belly or in the middle of your belly. Good. And now imagine a line that's running horizontally about an inch from your belly button. So now you can explain to the patient that your abdomen will be evaluated in these four quadrants, right upper, left upper, right lower, and left lower quadrant. So we'll start with having the patient position himself or herself properly. Uh, and for that, if I can ask uh, Stetson to lay down um, on, on, a, on a couch or a mat, and position the camera so we can see the belly. So an idea, a good instruction to give our patients is to allow or have them bend their hips and knees so their feet are on the couch or the mat. And this will allow your abdomen muscles to get loose. So when you're you know, examining or when, the, when you're instructing the patient to examine it, you can actually gain the most out of the exam. So uh, Stetson, what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna ask you to take your palm and place it in the middle of your uh, belly, just underneath your rib cage, okay? And I, I want you to press over here and tell me if that causes any tenderness. A, a very common complaint is going to be gastritis. So it's an important exam maneuver for these patients. Was that on the right side? So we'll start in the middle first. Okay. So that's your epigastrium area, and that's where commonly pain is uh, happening when patients are having gastritis or ulcerative uh, peptic ulcer disease. So no pain there? No. Okay. Now I want you to take again the palm of your hand and keep it flat on your belly. And we're gonna start with your left upper quadrant. And I want you to breathe in. Every time you press, and now press in hard with your hand. Good. And do the same thing in your left lower quadrant. Right okay. lower quadrant. No and pain right lower. Right upper quadrant. No pain right upper. Okay. So for gallbladder, the only uh, the specific instruction I'll give our patients is, uh, Stetson, I want you to just curve your finger slightly and put it in your rib cage and take a big deep breath in as you're pressing down. Does this cause any pain? No pain. Okay. And then for the appendix evaluation, I'll ask the patient to push your hand into the right upper quadrant or right lower quadrant, I'm sorry. Push in deep and then immediately let go. Does that cause any pain? No. Okay, good. So your abdominal examination again is very unremarkable and that's good. And then typically I always finish the abdominal exam with checking your hydration, just if in case the patient is complaining about diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, you wanna make sure that they are not dehydrated. So I'm gonna ask the patient to take their hand, place it like this with your other two fingers, pinch part of the palm, the back of the palm, stretch it up and let go. So we are looking for recoil of the skin. And then with Stetson's skin recoiling pretty quickly, that assures me that his hydration is good and he's not dehydrated. 
Perfect. Um, and this was the abdominal exam. So now we're gonna move on to the neuro and the psych examination. So um, a lot of the, the psych examination and neuro examination have a lot of overlap, especially focusing on the mental status and higher cognitive function. We usually would start with the level of alertness, which is very clearly visible as we are talking to the patient during the history, whether they are alert or they're sleepy, um, or they're kind of family member need to wake them up or they're confused. And when it comes to orientation, I ask certain questions like, Stetson, can you tell us what month and year we are in? We're in April, 2022. Okay, do you know where you are, which city you're physically located in? I'm currently in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And some orientation related questions also would include situational awareness. So do you know who's the governor of the state right now? Uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham. And the president of the United States? Biden. Good. Now we're gonna assess your language exam. So in language, as we were obtaining history from the patient, we are able to gather how fluent they are. But the other components of the language exam, like naming, comprehension, comprehension, repetition can easily be checked on a telemedicine. So uh, Stetson, uh, can you name the object I'm holding up on the screen? That looks like a pen. Good, and how about this? Glasses. And what's the clear part of the glasses? The lens. Good, I'm gonna ask you to do a few things. I want you to close your eyes real tight. Open your eyes. Now I want you to touch your right ear with your left index finger. So Stetson is having good comprehension for simple and complex commands. Now we're gonna talk, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to repeat a phrase. I want you to say, today is a bright and sunny day in Albuquerque. Today is a bright and sunny day in Albuquerque. Perfect. So the language exam had normal fluency, comprehension, repetition, and naming. The next thing I'm gonna check is your recall or your memory. So I'm gonna give you three words to remember. I want you to remember cat, apple, table. Can you repeat them? Yes, cat, apple, table. Okay, I'm gonna ask you these three words again after a few minutes. I want you to keep them in your mind. Um, the next task I'm gonna check is for your attention span. So I'm gonna ask you to subtract seven from a hundred and keep subtracting seven from the number you get. Okay. Can you start? Yes, 100, 93, 86, 79, 72, 65. Perfect, thank you. And then could you go, could you tell me the name of the months starting from December, but going backwards? December, November, October, September, August, July, June, May, April, March, February, January. And do you remember the three words I'd asked you to remember? Cat, apple, table. Perfect. And, and then this is kind of the higher mental cognitive function ass assessment that we can easily do on a telemedicine. And then for your mood and affect, I'm seeing that you're in a pleasant mood and normal affect. And that kind of covers our neuro psych, neurocognitive function and the psych exam. For the cranial nerve exam, we do not do an olfactory nerve or cranial nerve one exam, even routinely in a clinical basis, and we don't have to do it on, in an office or a telehealth visit. And then for the extraocular movement, the three, four, six cranial nerve, we do the same things as we did for the eye exam and asking the patient to look in different directions. Um, for the pupils, again, for the optic nerve, that will be the same thing as we already did in the eye exam. For the fifth nerve, which is the face trigeminal nerve, I'm gonna ask uh, our patient to have a Q-tip or a cotton ball ready in hand if they have uh, readily access to it. And then with that Q-tip, I want you to strike or stroke both sides of your forehead. Does that feel the same on right and left side? Yes. And the same thing over your right and left cheek. And yes, it feels the same. And the right and left jawline? Yes. Okay, and now for your facial nerve, uh, I'm gonna ask you to give me a big smile and show me your teeth like this. <laughs> Good, and raise your eyebrows up like you're surprised. Good, so that's telling us that your facial nerve is working perfectly. Um, 
For the ninth and 10th cranial nerve, I'm gonna ask our patients to open their mouth, stick their tongue out and say, ah, that will allow me to see the uvula movement. And we can always ask our patient to use the flashlight if the lighting is inappropriate. So if you don't uh, mind doing that, so his uvula and palate both are moving midline as he says, ah. Uh, and then um, for the 11th, I'm gonna ask the patient to put their hand on their side of the cheek like this and turn their head against their hand. And then the same thing on the other side. Are you feeling equal amount of resistance, Stetson, when you do that? Yes. So that's your cranial nerve 11th, checking your sternocleidomastite. And then for the tongue, for the 12th nerve, I'm going to ask you to stick your tongue out. Move it side to side. Good. And so that's checking the 12th nerve. Um, I'm going to then ask the patient to sit down so we can do a motor exam. And I typically divide the neuro exam into upper body and lower body to minimize patients sort of moving back and forth between the repositioning the camera. So for motor, I'm going to ask Stetson to bring both of the arms, both of the arms up like this. And now close your eyes and keep your arms up. And what we are looking for is any drift, asymmetrical drift on one side or any pronation. Uh, which can be an indication of a sign of uh, corticospinal tract weakness. Uh, Stetson, if you can open your mind, uh, open your eyes. I'm going to ask you to roll your arms like this. Okay. So what we are looking for is whether the patient has any satelliting. That's a sign of weakness in which the weak arm will stay still and then the other arm, other arm will sort of start revolving around the weak arm. So we can see now that Stetson is, you know, good and symmetric with his arm rolling movement. And we'll start with, uh, we'll, we'll finish the upper extremity motor exam with fine finger movement. So I want you, Stetson, to tap your uh, thumb with individual fingers one at a time. And then same thing on the other side. And what we are looking for is any obvious asymmetry that can be an indication of a previous uh, event like a stroke. Good. Um, and then... I want you to hold your finger about an arm's length away like this. Now with your other finger, touch your nose and then touch the other finger and go back and forth. And this way we are checking for any finger to nose dysmetria uh, without actually needing any other person or uh, help at the bedside or in the home. Good. And then again, we'll have the patient use the Q-tip to um, test, test for light touch sensations on both arms. Um, and does this feel the same on the other side? Yes, it tickles. Okay, that's normal and good. So we're going to move. Um, I usually then focus on the lower extremities. So if you can point the camera towards your uh, legs and you can keep sitting for Should this. Should I stay part. sitting? Yeah. Yes. So I would ask or start by asking the patient to lift up their right foot as much as they can and keep it up for five seconds. Four three, two, one, and repeat the same thing on the other side. So I'm not seeing any obvious drift in the legs, which is a good sign. And then for the heel to shin dysmetria test, I'm gonna ask the patient, Stetson, if you can put your heel on top of your right knee and slide it up and down on your shin in a straight line. Good, and same thing on the other side. Perfect. So that's a normal exam for the lower extremity while sitting. And for the next part, I'm gonna ask Stetson if you can stand up. And maybe if we can point the camera towards your whole body. And we're gonna ask you to, um, we're gonna, what we're gonna ask you now is if you can walk back towards the room and walk towards the camera with by keeping one foot in front of the other, like you're walking on a tightrope. So we're checking his balance. Good, and now walk on your toes. So that's allowing me to screen for any L5 radiculopathies and S1 radiculopathies. And now I want you to uh, squat down as low as you can, and then stand up. Depending on the type of patient we are seeing, we may not be able, or if they're an elderly patient, we may not be able to ask them to do this, but this is a good screen for lower extremity strength exam. And the fact that the patient is able to do it is very reassuring. Um, if we are suspecting weakness on one side or the other, we can ask them to do one leg squats at a time. 
again, may not apply to every single patient, but if they can do it, it can allow us to look for any asymmetry in the examination of the lower extremity strength. And this is basically the entire neuro examination. So for the final part, I'm gonna talk briefly about musculoskeletal examination. And just to um, let everyone know for musculoskeletal examination, there is a very beautiful comprehensive um, paper written by the PMNR group of Mayo Clinic in the Mayo Clinic proceedings, which details every little maneuver that one may need for a detailed musculoskeletal examination by Dr. Leskowski. So if you see a lot of patients who are a, who, you know, so a lot of patient problems pertaining to joint aches and pains, that's a very excellent article I would recommend uh, reviewing. And that's again, Mayo Clinic's proceeding, Dr. Laskowski, Telemedicine of Musculoskeletal Examination. Um, so for the musculoskeletal examination, I again would divide them into upper body and lower body. For the upper body, I'm gonna start typically with the neck. So uh, Stetson, if you can move your head or neck in this direction, move it to the side and the other side, front and back. And then just rotate it around. Does this cause any pain? No. Okay. And then I want you to just feel for the muscle tension in the back of your neck. Does this cause any tenderness when you press it there? No. And also your trapezius. Any pain here? No. Okay. A lot of patients complain of C uh, cervical radiculopathy and a good remote way to check for any radiculopathy is uh, with this furling exam. So, and uh, that can be done easily remotely. So I'm gonna ask Edson to bend his neck in one direction. And with your other hand, just gently press on your neck. Does this cause any sharp radiating pain in your right arm? No. And we're gonna do the same thing on the other side. Any radiating pain in your left arm? No pain in my arm. Okay. So that's, that's called the spurling sign. Um, for the next, again, individually, we can look at the shoulder joints, elbow joints, and the wrist joints, and we can ask the patient to expose the joint. For example, we can cover elbow here. I'm gonna look at the joint. I don't see any obvious edema or swelling or deformity. I'm gonna ask the patient to move the elbow joint in all the axes as possible and straighten your, your elbow. And now twist your hand. Does this cause any pain? No. Okay, I want you to take your other hand and press the sides of your elbow. Does this cause any pain? No. Okay, and now at the, at the bony part of the elbow, press right here. Is there any tenderness there? No pain or tenderness. Okay, and then another common complaint that uh, providers encounter in the outpatient setting are carpal tunnel syndrome or carpal tunnel, um, which is the compression of median nerve at the wrist. So I'm gonna ask the patient to hold their hand like this, which is a Fallon sign. So you wanna ask your patient to hold the arm or hand position just like this for a couple of minutes and ask whether holding the arm for this in prolonged time causes any numbness or tingling in the thumb, index finger and middle finger. So we're gonna ask the patient to keep their arms like this for at least a minute, I would say. Um, is, do you, are you having any symptoms of numbness, tingling in your thumb, index finger, Stetson? No, no tingling so far. Good. So that's the upper body. For another common complaint is the low back pain that uh, our patients complain about. So I typically start by checking the range of motion. So uh, Stetson, if you can stand up, uh, and we're going to just check how much we can move your back. So I want you to bend all the way back as much as possible. Okay, and now bend forward like you're trying to touch your toes. And any pain in either of these two movements? No. And then bend to the side and the other way. No pain. Good. And then for the lower back examination, our ability to squat and overlapping a lot of neuro exam for the lower extremities is also relevant. So you wanna make sure that you check for their sensations, their gait, their ability to stand on their toes because that is a very good screen for L5 radiculopathies. And then 
um, in certain situations where I am worried about lower back pain um, being from a radiculopathy of S1, for example, I ask the patient to do a straight leg test at home. So for that, I would ask uh, the patient to lay down on the mat. And then as you're laying down, I want you to lift your entire right leg up as straight as possible for about 45 to 60 degrees. Does that cause any pain in your uh, back or shooting pain in your leg? It does not. Okay. So that's our straight leg raise test. Um, so, you know, these were the important um, examination maneuvers that I wanted to share with everyone about what I have learned, which are relatively easily done on a telemedicine encounter. And, um, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of it has been published and reviewed in the last couple of years, especially with the onset of COVID. But um, if I can answer any other question that the audience may have, I'm more than happy to. And again, thank you for your time. And thank you, Stetson, for helping to be our patient today. Yeah, it was an honor showing off my COVID dress code. <laughs> If you do have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and jump in. Hey you guys, no question, but my gosh, that was the most thorough and uh, you were amazing going through the exam. Uh, I've, it, to, uh, so I work oversee telehealth at Presbyterian and to me, to be able to see all the different ways I, uh, apologize, I couldn't join at the very beginning, but that was, I heard there was a recording and I think that was, is going to be fabulous. I, we run into issues all the time, not sure how to do that and feel effective. And I've never seen anything like that, that just was so comprehensive and clearly for your specialty, ways that you can really very, very effectively and safely, you know, do telehealth. So I, I just wanted to jump on, no questions. I'm I got to absorb it all, but uh, that was really Thanks. smooth and incredibly well done. Thanks, Thank Sharon. Dr. Jarotra has a fabulous slide. I don't know if you want to bring it back up again or not, but it showed he went through, um, was it 13 different organ systems? So you can maximize billing depending on which specialty you're yeah. in or as primary care. Yeah, let me just pull that up. And then I also yeah, I want to take that big screen through the organization. That was incredible. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I would agree. I have a question really quickly. Yes. Have you adapted any of this for parents to do at home with their kids? Oh, that's good. That's a great question. I mean, we can definitely educate and teach. I primarily am a neurologist, so I don't work with kids a lot, but I don't see how it will require a degree of education to the parents. Um, but it is something that can be definitely taught to them because, you know, especially with kids, you know, with having some chronic diseases, it does, it does become important to monitor their progress without exposing them to unnecessary risk. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's a great idea and that could be a good project that we can work, you know, between different pediatrics department in the city and the state. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds like the next webinar with Dr. Jarotra. Yeah, that's another <laughs> fun one. Um, and I also shared with everyone in the chat the, um, the article that I was referring about for the detailed musculoskeletal exam. Again, a very thoroughly written, uh, a comprehensive guide to do a detailed musculoskeletal exam by, by the Mayo Clinic PM&R department. So I strongly recommend reviewing that if a lot of your patients do have you know, complaints like back pain, shoulder pain, things like that. Great. That's also a resource we could add to the Telehealth Alliance website. So we'll be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Lori, is there any wrap up slides for what's coming next before we end? Um, I just wanna note next Thursday, we have our New Mexico Telehealth Work Group. Um, 
That is Thursday at two. That we will be covering treatment of substance use disorder via telehealth. And then at the end of the month on Wednesday, the 27th, we will be hosting a webinar with Mark Maydew from Urgent uh, Duke City Urgent Care. He'll be talking about their hospital at home um, program and, and how they've been innovating in that in that realm with telehealth. Laurie, Thank I don't know. you, Lori. Just a mm -hmm. kind of a small item. Um, yeah. We started to send out our the links. Christine from you know, it was terrific Monday, Tuesday, um, and then we ran into issues with not being able to access. We think it was something with all the cybersecurity procedures tightening within Presbyterian, hmm. uh, but okay. quickly recalled that, and so. Um, because uh, initially not able to, to get in, the site was blocked and stuff. And so I don't know if that's a, we did ask our IT department to be able to make the link. Um, uh, I don't know if you use the same link, but to put it in yeah. secure so people could access. Jennifer tested it later in the week and she was able to do so. Okay. Uh, it really you... prevented us from being able to broadly share it within Presbyterian because oh. we were very concerned that we, Literally, I had sent it before then going in to sign up for myself and then running into it being blocked and, uh, so and you stuff. could even you could even get on the site. I could not. And okay. um, um, so just, uh, you know, we are trying to work through it on Prez. I don't know, again, if it was just something with our system and we yeah. asked, do you use the same link for future ones? Because this we thought providers would be super interested in this one and we're anxious to be able to to really go broad. And then once we were seeing it blocked by our website, we had to pull it back. Um, um, yeah, I haven't heard of that problem with uh, with anyone else. Um, so I'd like to think it's just Presbyterians. And we're doing a lot of <laughs> issue which, these days. It's a hot topic in terms. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't. Yeah, yeah I don't know why it would do that. We'll work on other that than your sure. other than your level of security yeah maybe a pdf or maybe we could try other things and see if they sneak through without causing a problem yeah perfect just a just a and i said we'll be i'd love to be able to share this webinar so i was tickled yeah. to hear you doing that um but mm -hmm. love yeah, to be able and, to get and, more folks able to come and and that has been a little bit of an internal challenge that we've got to figure out and so i'll i will circle back to our it yeah um, we were hesitant even after Jennifer did it, then I couldn't tell if it was going to work or not. So, okay. um, um, and it Presbyterian, you can view YouTube videos, right? Oh, can you do that when you're on our VPN? I was able to do it from a link yesterday. Okay. Now what okay. I couldn't do today was get into the zoom from my work computer. I'm doing it on my mm -hmm. phone. Oh, okay. Okay. I know it can sometimes be a challenge with the VPN, like the uh, quality isn't. Um, it's it's hard to be on video, audio, and uh, VPN for some people. Um, but the reason I ask about YouTube is our our videos are uploaded to YouTube and then they're linked through the website. But I can make sure that you have the um, direct YouTube link if that makes it then you have you can bypass the website maybe that makes it a little more easy a little right. easier uh, i'd love yeah. to try it because we tend to you know um i don't don't go to youtube too much during the course of the day and so i haven't actually tested that uh, most yeah. of them will go right into other webinars so i, I just need to to validate yeah so, but thank you this was terrific yeah. and that was uh yeah. Uh, we were excited to see the topic and felt like it was one that's very um, relevant to providers uh, and to see it happen and do so smoothly was was wonderfully, um, I think, confidence building. <laughs> yeah, thanks. We'll, we'll work on you with that, Sharon. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I know you have to hop to a next meeting, so this will be really quick. If you go to our website, nmtelehealth.org, there is a brand new announcement about audio-only billing in New Mexico. If you click on see details, we have summarized this announcement into one sentence, the definition of telemedicine under state law, according to the office of the Secretary of Insurance, Russell Toll, will allow audio only 
telemedicine billing indefinitely. That is covered under the law, in their opinion. We have some more information about it. We have a link to the law. And then the full email straight from the horse's mouth is right here as a link. And this is the multi-page email that we condensed down. And that is from Julie Weinberg at the New Mexico office, the superintendent of insurance. So feel free to go check that out. Um, that applies to New Mexico healthcare entities and not Medicare and Medicaid. We're still waiting to hear from them. But just so you know, that's, that's on our website and is a great read. Thanks, right. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.